first like to get started by inviting Michael Hiltzik. Uh, he is the uh, prize-winning, Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, journalist at the Los Angeles Times. He actually has a business column where he discusses a lot about Social Security, Medicare, and the politics of entitlements. Uh, He is also the author of several books, uh, two of which include The Plot Against Social Security, How the Bush Plan Endangers Our Financial Future, and The New Deal, A Modern History. Welcome, Michael. Well, thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. Michael, I've got to tell you that I've followed your work for a long time now, and I think that you get it right. When so many of your colleagues in, in the journalism industry get it wrong, uh, why, why do you think that you have the, the, the right lens? Well, that's very nice of you to say. Uh, I, I think one thing that I do that, unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues do not, is that I go to the, uh, to the raw material, to the, to the original numbers. Uh, I make sure that I read the trustees' reports. Um, uh, basically, I, I, I delve very deeply into the, the, the basic statistics and the basic figures about all of these programs, Social Security and Medicare. Right. Uh, and I, I don't accept anything uh, really uh, on faith. Right, and a lot of your colleagues in the uh, in the industry actually listen to sound bites and then take it from there instead of uh, doing the the primary research themselves. Well, it, it's been very frustrating over the years, and I know you've seen this, and certainly I have. Uh, and that is that the the, the basic uh, arguments never change. The numbers sometimes change, but uh, going back to 1935, uh, we've heard the same things from opponents and critics and really enemies of Social Security and and since the 60s of Medicare. Uh, The the arguments aren't really a moving target, Mm -hmm. uh, and yet they seem to, uh, I think recently they have seem to have gotten a lot more purchase than they had in the past. Right. So this week's column you wrote about the top five lies about entitlements. What are they? Well, these (laughs) these are the five biggest current lies. There are certainly many more. Yes, there are. Um, Lie number one, as I as I put it, was was the, this idea that the payroll tax hike is killing the retail economy. And what I pointed out is that there hasn't been a payroll tax increase. Uh, what what we've done is restore it to where it was uh, two or three years ago, uh, when it was cut really as a stimulus instrument rather than as a change in Social Security. And the reason what's really killing the retail economy at the low end of the income scale is that we haven't restored what President Obama had put in three years ago, which was the making work pay Mm -hmm. tax credit. Mm -hmm. The payroll tax holiday was supposed to be a substitute for that, uh, but we always knew that that the real problem was that we were not delivering stimulus, we were not delivering assistance to people at the low end of the income scale. Right. So the payroll tax uh, actually was basically restored to its previous levels as a result of the New Year Day deal, which extended the Bush era tax cuts. And so, um, you know, so now people are trying to spin that as something that's harmful to the economy. Right. And that's that's really deceptive. Uh, Line number two that I pointed out was this idea that you get from Pete Peterson, you know, the the hedge fund billionaire who's really got an axe out for Social Security and Medicare. This is the idea that entitlement, and I put that in quotes because I really don't like that term. But the Earn benefits, benefits. Earn benefits. Ben, right. Re- benefits for millionaires and billionaires are a costly problem. And what I pointed out is that uh, the, all of the Social Security benefits that go to people who have more than a million dollars or more in income, that's about uh, something in the neighborhood of three quarters of one percent of all the benefits that go out from social security the idea there is that if you try to means test social security you cannot do it by cutting out payments to millionaires and billionaires you have to dig deep deep down and dean baker a great economist uh... uh progressive economist has pointed this out you have to de- dig deep down into to people who earn thirty and forty thousand uh, dollars that's not means testing that's just cutting benefits Mm-hmm. Uh, then uh, the third lie that I pointed out is the so-called infinite horizon estimate. This is where you get this figure that Social Security and Medicare are $60 trillion in the hole. This is really just designed as a scare tactic. Real actuaries, real economists don't use these figures because basically they're, they're an attempt to give you the present value of all of the deficits that you might see in these programs going out to infinity. 
Michael, uh, where where have the real economists been? I haven't seen them on television. Uh, they don't seem to be conferring on Capitol Hill uh, because a lot of policymakers are citing the uh, the fake numbers. Well, I think they're not invited. <laughs> That's one of the problems is that they're not invited you, to the party. You, you, you hear people citing the infinite horizon projection you, you don't uh, dean baker doesn't get invited very much on on tv and when he does he's out shouted uh, so what you get are uh, uh reporters and correspondents and economists who are just parroting these old shibboleths uh they have the floor so i think what we really need to see is 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 a, a more balanced presentation so that progressive economists those who've really done the work and actuaries who really understand these programs get their voices heard, and, and you know, we can't do that unless somehow they gain access to uh, uh, to the megaphones that, that we right. see on television. So they exaggerate the numbers to make it seem like the sky is falling, and you have to do something now. That's right. What's number you four? You have to do it now. Number four is this idea that you're paying too much for your benefits, or turn it around, you're not paying enough for your benefits. This is the idea that you get, uh, you know, we saw it in a Wall Street Journal op-ed from the hedge fund manager Stanley Druckenmiller who said a typical third grader will only get back 75 cents for every dollar he puts into Social Security while many seniors with greater means are pocketing a handsome profit. And this goes back to the Urban Institute estimate by Gene Sterling and Stephanie Renan uh, who said, yeah, uh, uh, who actually said on a present value basis most Americans put a little bit more into Social Security, then they're going to get back in, in value from it because it's not a pension program. It's, an, it's a social insurance program. It's there if you need it. A lot of it is there when you need it. There's right. certainly a minimum that everybody gets. So that's a basic misunderstanding. Just like we, we pay programs. more out in our, in our car insurance and our homeowner's insurance than we'll ever get back in because we want it there as protection for the what-ifs and the just-in-cases. That's right. And by the way, those benefits from your car insurance and your, your auto insurance, when you do get them, they're not means-tested. You know, you, you get what you were promised. That's right. And you, you depend on the insurance companies to, uh, to handle your premiums with prudence. And I think Social Security has also done that. Well, that's an important point because just week, this, just this week, uh, the president has offered means testing as a part of the grand bargain cuts that he's willing to entertain. He's trying to sell Republicans on this. And they have embraced means testing in the past separately, but they seem not to want to embrace the president's efforts to cut Social Security. I think it's worth explaining to our listeners because a lot of progressives think, OK, why not let the wealthy pay more for these benefits? Well, the fact of the matter is that the wealthy, the, the, I think we confuse the idea of means testing with the idea of a progressive structure in Social mm -hmm. Security. Means mm -hmm. testing to me is that if you want to get the benefits, you have to sort of show your wealth, you have to show your net worth and your income to, to some gimlet-eyed bureaucrat. This is the sort of means testing that Harry Hopkins tried to eradicate in the 1930s when he was in charge of relief programs for FDR. What we do have is a progressive structure for Social Security. You get relatively less as a replacement for your income the, the wealthier you are. And of course, over a certain level, you do pay income taxes on some of your Social Security. Right. That's proper. In fact, you, you pay a higher premium for Medicare as you get wealthier. That's proper because the tax, the, 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 the payroll tax, on particularly for social security is highly regressive uh, mm -hmm. uh people lower income people pay a much higher percent of their income for social security than upper income people do and the only way to redress that is by these adjustments uh wealthier people get relatively less from social security than the middle class and the working class they pay relatively more so we've already done that and, and I think it's important to keep in mind that, uh, that we've probably done it about as much as we can because it's really important that we preserve the idea of universality for all of these programs okay. so that they don't become seen as welfare. As programs. welfare. And the second that you have welfare, then you lose public support for it. That's exactly right. And okay. we've seen this happen over and over again. Welfare is, is always a dirty word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always the first thing that gets cut. 
uh, when, when governments decide that, that they don't want to spend as much money. And the one thing that has saved Social Security and Medicare all these years is the idea that it's really there for everybody. Well, in fact, you know, they, you know, they're trying to turn the word entitlements into uh, the the uh, uh, something that means welfare uh, in an effort to pull that kind of Jedi mind trick on the American people. Number five. Number five is that Medicare, Social Security, well, it's all the same. So, you, you know, you often hear, uh, uh, you know, critics of these programs say, well, uh, yeah, Social Security's not really in much fiscal trouble. Medicare's in a lot of fiscal trouble, but they're both entitlements. So the way to get at this is to cut Social Security. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact of the matter is, as I've tried to point out many, many times, if, if you want to if you accept that Social Security has a fiscal imbalance, and I think it's probably not as true as most people think it is, you can always deal with that within the four walls of Social Security. You can adjust benefits, you can adjust the payroll tax, and you can rebalance the program. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that with Medicare because Medicare's fiscal problems really are external to the structure of the program. They, they, they have to do with what we spend on health care in this country and the only way to really address medicare's fiscal imbalance is to hit that externality is to reduce the the cost of health care in the general economy and that's something of course that health care reform the affordable care act has started to do mm -hmm. but it's only a start but but uh, if you don't do that then all you're doing is really hacking away at medicare benefits right a and that's something that we really want to avoid because if you do that you end up driving up costs for health care across the entire spectrum right. of users. In so the in five is the structure of Medicare is not the problem. The problem is, is that we have skyrocketing health care costs in this country that are in part driven by rising health care inflation and a poor health of uh, unhealthy population uh, that has, uh, you know, preventable chronic diseases that are expensive. Right. And these programs mm -hmm. are very, very different from one another. Their issues are very different, and it, it's really a lie. It's certainly a mistake. Really, it's a lie to treat them as though they, they, they're really uh, both the same. Got it. So now there are three other myths that I want us to tackle briefly before I let you go. One is the intergenerational theft myth. That's right. Well, this is something that we're hearing more and more, and as I told my readers uh, a, a few weeks ago, you're going to hear it even more in the future uh, than you do today. And this is the idea that... Uh, we don't spend enough on children. We spend too much on seniors. So the answer to that is to cut seniors' benefits and spend it on children. Mm -hmm. w what I pointed out is, first of all, that's a real stretch, uh, even to think in, in political terms that a dollar you save by cutting benefits, uh, by cutting Social Security benefits, you're going to end up spending on children. The other thing is that it, that it, it's really uh, a, a myth, and it's 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 really incorrect. To treat these two programs or these two needs as as a part of a single zero sum game, mm -hmm. the fact is, if you agree that we don't spend enough money on early uh, on preschool education or on child health, there's no reason to say, well, the only place we can get that money right. is the spending that we do on elders. You can get it from anywhere. You can raise taxes. You can get it from the, the defense, defense department. Budget. Yeah, these, that's exactly these, right. These two. Spending modes are, are by no means uh, connected to one another, except in the minds of people who really just want to cut Social Security. In fact, I mean, I like to point out that uh, our children will need Social Security and Medicare even perhaps more so than their parents. These are the children of the recession generation. And people who are arguing that we need to cut the benefits to save the benefits are actually uh, trying to undercut our children's future. Is that not correct? Well, that's, that's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It's future generations who would really pay the price if we started cutting benefits now. That's right. And, and, I, and I also want to point out uh, something I, I did in that column, that uh, a lot of w we spend a tremendous amount on behalf of future generations. All the money we spend on infrastructure, all the money we spend on national defense, uh, uh, the money we spend on services and, and schools and keeping teachers employed, this is an investment in the future, and it will mm -hmm. enrich our children and our grandchildren, mm -hmm. just as we have been enriched by the spending that this country undertook starting in the 1930s with the New Deal. That's right. Uh, which we still, we drive on those roads, we fly in and out of those airports, we take those, we take trail, uh, trains that run on those rails, we have studied 
at the schools that, that were built, and they're still there for us. They're still there, and they're crumbling, unfortunately. We do need to invest. Uh, the last one I want to touch on is that um, I'm hearing more and more that, you know, the sky is falling because the baby boomers are retiring, and, and we can't, you know, we can't meet the needs of all these baby boomers. Yet the 1982-83 reforms actually pre-advance, uh, prepaid for the b- baby boomers, at least in Social Security, correct? That's absolutely true, and and that was explicit at the time. Uh, uh, you can go back in the record, you see quotes from Bob Dole, who was on that Greenspan Commission, saying, we know there's a baby boom coming, and we want to we want to pay for it. All of the money that's been built up in the Social Security Trust Fund, it's $2.8 trillion right now, and it's real assets. Uh, this, this is money that was gathered in the payroll tax starting in 1983. We... Uh, all of us who've been paying payroll tax uh, since then have paid more into the system than we needed for uh, for current benefits at the time, and, and in fact, to a certain extent, than we need for ourselves. And we've banked that money. We've invested it in Treasury bonds. It's there. It's uh, it's throwing off interest, which gets credited to the program every year. And by the way, every Treasury Secretary, Republican and Democrat, every Labor Secretary, Republican and Democrat, who've been trustees of the system, which they are uh, ex officio, has signed off on trustees reports since 1983, certifying that these are real assets, uh, that they are real funds and, and a real interest payments. Republicans and Democrats, so this notion that that money doesn't really exist uh, or that we have not pre-funded the baby boomer retirements, that I think that, that's more than a lie. That's a fraud on the public to say. Right, that. And, and the last piece of fraud, and I'm sorry, I told you the last one was the last one, but this one is a big lie, uh, and that is the only way that you can save these programs is to cut these programs. I think that's one of the biggest lies out there. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that you can also raise revenue, and scrapping the cap is one part of that equation. Right. I think you, you can scrap the payroll tax cap. I think there, there, there are legitimate historical reasons to do that. Uh, the payroll tax is something that all Americans really should be paying. And, and, and by the way, let's not forget that the very idea of cutting benefits, the truth is, that given the economy and given the structure of retirement savings in this country today, what you really need to do is increase benefits. That's right. Uh, you need to increase benefits. You need to restore programs like the benefits for, uh, for the children of deceased workers so that they continue to get benefits through their college years, uh, something that Paul Ryan uh, benefited from and yet doesn't recognize how important it was for his family that it should be just as important for other families. So, yes. Right, I advocate, and I've written this too, we should, uh, benefits should be increased, not cut. That's exactly right. Uh, so we need to be looking at benefit increases and not cuts. And ter- in, in fact, the Commission of Modernized Social Security, modernizedsocialsecurity.org, came up with a plan to show exactly how you can do it. Not only uh, can you extend Social Security solvency for an additional 75 years, but you can also raise enough revenue doing that to actually strengthen benefits over the long haul to ensure that our children get a just retirement themselves. So right, with that, yeah. Uh, absolutely true. Thank you very much, Michael Hiltzik. You are an inspiration to us all. Continue to pump out those great articles at the Los Angeles Times. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me.